Good morning, church family. Christ is risen. What a privilege it is to come and preach and, and bring God's word on Easter Sunday. And this is a day that we celebrate. Thank you, John, for leading us in remembering what Christ has accomplished. And how many of you took time, you don't have to answer out loud, just to reflect on the day that God saved you. Reflect on the day that you had a grace awakening and realize that your salvation is not your work, but God's. What a day. I took a moment and, and sat there in my chair and remembered reading Galatians and Romans 4 and, and reading about salvation being what God accomplishes on behalf of sinners. And it's setting me free. And we praise God for that today. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And our primary text will be verses 12 to 20. But we'll hop around chapter 15 as well. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Before we dive into that passage, I'd like to read Luke 24, verses 1 through 6. Luke 24, verses 1 through 6. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but he has risen. That is our celebration today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friday night we had a service here, and it was a meaningful service where we reflected on Christ's passion and his suffering on behalf of sinners like you and me. As we read, we observed that Christ was betrayed. He was denied. He was rejected for us. He wore a crown of thorns. He was nailed to the cross. He was pierced. And he died for sinners. He cried, it is finished, and he breathed his last. And he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus Christ suffered and died so that sinners could be forgiven and take hold of the life that is truly life. But what if the gospel story ended there? What if the gospel story ended with Christ in the tomb? What if he died for our sins but there was no resurrection from the dead? What is Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, the Apostle Paul answers these questions and more in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 20. Please read the text with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 20. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say... That there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead. For not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised. Then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. Moreover we are found to be false witnesses of God. Because we testified against God. That he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise. If in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Christ, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. 
then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be most pitied. Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead collapses. It is futile. It is empty. In our text today, the Apostle Paul gives several ways that Christianity fails if there were no resurrection. And my purpose today as we work through this text is to declare the absolute necessity of Christ's resurrection. As John said, of Christ's entire work. On behalf of sinners. For the purpose of, of motivating you. Of causing you to boast in Christ along. As the song said that we sang. To boast in the resurrection. To boast in what Christ has accomplished. So that we can believe properly. Behave properly. And worship properly. So if we're asking a question today, it is this. What if there were no resurrection? Let's jump right into the text. Verse 12. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead. How do some, of, some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 12 highlights a problem that was going on in the church at Corinth. False teaching that denied the resurrection of the dead. Specifically that of believers had crept into the church. So Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 to counter such teaching. And he opened his argument against such false teaching by immediately pointing to the reality that the apostles preached that Christ had been raised from the dead. The earliest Christian messages were messages, were messages of the resurrection of a man from the dead who claimed to be God. Listen to how verses 1 through 4 of 1 Corinthians describe the earliest Christian message. Now I'll make known to you, brethren, the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news, which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. The earliest Christian preaching emphasizes the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It boldly proclaimed that this man named Jesus died at the hands of Romans who knew how to execute people. He died and was put in a borrowed tomb but defeated death and the grave by his resurrection. However, there were some at the Corinthian church that denied the resurrection of the dead. It's not certain who these individuals were, but they were most likely Greeks who did believe in the immortality of the soul. But they also believed that the body was a hindrance to true life. And they looked forward to the day when the soul and the body would be separated at death. Foster says that common people believe that death was either extinction of the soul or a worthless shadow life. And this most likely is the form of disbelief which would have been prevalent in the Corinthian church. Does that sound familiar? They believe that death was either extinction or annihilation. Many in our society that believe that today. That nothing happens when you die. That This is all that there is. This is why I believe when we had a pandemic and, and people were face to face with death, they lost it. Because it forced people to come to grips with their own mortality. They also believed that death was a worthless shadow life to come. For most, that is what many believe today. They believe in some form of afterlife, but it is a mere shadow. It's not as good as the life that we have in the here and now. But scripture actually teaches the opposite for believers in Christ. There will be a day when our soul will be reunited to a resurrected, 
glorified, incorruptible body. And we'll dwell with Christ on a new heaven and a new earth. And righteousness will dwell. And that'll be our great hope. For the believer in Christ, the life to come is the life that is truly life. That's the life that we look forward to. This is the shadow in the here and now. For the believer in Christ, this life is as bad as it gets. The true life is the life to come. But some today, just as in Corinth, deny the very resurrection of the dead. So Paul responds to this issue and false doctrine of the resurrection being denied in verse 13. He goes on to say, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. To deny the resurrection of the dead is to deny the resurrection of Christ. In logic, this is called a reduction to absurdity. Paul, in essence, says, let's go along with the absurd notion that the dead are not raised and carry it to its logical conclusion. If the dead aren't raised, then that means Christ hasn't been raised because he was dead. But Christ has been raised, therefore his people will be raised. Why? Because Christ is one with his people. Because he's the firstborn from the dead. Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection from the dead. You can't have one without the other. So Paul's going to spend the remainder of this passage highlighting the damaging effects to Christianity if there were no resurrection of Christ. So what's Paul's argument up to this point? If there is no resurrection of the dead, there is no resurrection of Christ. And if there is no resurrection of Christ, Christianity is empty. It is futile. It collapses. And I find in this passage three negative consequences to Christianity of Christ were not raised. First, in verse 14, Christianity is empty if Christ were not raised. Verse 15, Christianity is false if Christ is not raised. And verses 16 through 19, Christianity is powerless if Christ was not raised from the dead. Let's jump into each of those. First, Christianity without the resurrection of Christ is empty. Paul continues in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also is in vain. The word vain there means without results. Empty-handed, hollow, meaningless, without substance. The apostles' preaching and the believers' faith would have no substance if Christ wasn't risen from the dead. The gospel minus the resurrection of Jesus Christ is hollow and empty. Why? Because we strip an essential pillar out of the gospel message. Without the resurrection, the gospel story ends with a man who claimed to be the savior of the world, who claimed to give eternal life, who claimed to be the resurrection and the life, but is dead. That rings empty if there is no resurrection. This is not to take away from the sufficiency of the cross and what Christ accomplished, but in his resurrection, Christ was declared the Son of God by being raised from the dead. His resurrection confirmed that he was who he said he was. Listen to Romans 1, 3 through 4. Concerning his son Jesus, who was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh, and who was declared the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of Christ, we ultimately have nothing to preach. Our, our preaching is hollow. Our faith has no substance. You really have no reason for being here today. But don't leave. Because he has been raised from the dead. And if there is no resurrection from the dead. Our labor and our service to the Lord is in vain. But the good news of Easter is verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. And because he has been raised from the dead, your faith has substance. Your faith is not empty. It's not hollow. It has no hollow ring to it because Christ has been raised from the dead. 
the hard work that you do for the Lord, your labor in this body, your service to the Lord, your raising your children in the fear and instruction of the Lord, your walking in obedience to the Lord is not in vain because Christ has been risen from the dead. Next, Christianity without the resurrection is false. This is verse 15. Christianity without the resurrection is false. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God. When Paul says we there, he is referring to himself and the other apostles. We are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. If there were no resurrection of Jesus Christ, the apostles were false witnesses. They were the false teachers. The preaching of the apostles from the very beginning of Christianity, as I said before, was that Christ defeated death and the grave. Listen to Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 22, 23 to 24. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God, don't you love the but God statements in Scripture? You nailed him to the cross, you put him to death, but God, the good news of Easter, raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible possible for him to be held in its power. This is the message of the early church. This is the preaching upon which the church was built. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The apostles went to their graves declaring that Christ had risen. And if there were no resurrection, the apostles were either delusional or intentionally deceptive. Either way, our faith would be founded on a falsehood and it would collapse. If Christ was not raised, we can't trust anything the apostles said. We can't trust what Jesus himself said. And we can't trust what's written in Scripture. Because they all claimed as foundational to the faith something that did not happen. But now, verse 20, Christ has been raised from the dead. Therefore, our faith isn't founded on falsehood, but on truth. Our faith is, faith is founded on the truth of God. Listen to some of the convincing proofs of Christ's resurrection. There were 500 eyewitnesses to the risen Christ. 500. How many witnesses does it take for something to hold up in a court of law? Not 500. <laughs> right? Two? One? Many of these witnesses would have still been alive when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. I like what Jay Adams says. He says, the historical foundation... And the testimony of so many credible witnesses arrayed in these brief verses is unparalleled. If you doubt the historical fact of his resurrection, says Paul, then go ask the witnesses. Most of them are still alive. That was written of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul speaks of the 500 witnesses that attested to Christ's resurrection. Another convincing proof of the resurrection is the Reality that the apostles died for their belief in the resurrection. I'm not going to ask how many of you have ever told a lie. Because you'd probably lie by not raising your hands. Um, but how many, if you, for instance, if you ever told a lie, how many of you have ever told a lie to hurt yourself? Right, so that you would get... Like in trouble. I was a manager for some time. And I remember nobody ever came and told me a lie. So that they would get fired. Right? It was usually to protect their jobs. Men tell lies to, to protect themselves. Not to be martyred. Beaten. Persecuted. Ostracized as the apostles were. And they never recanted the resurrection. Listen to Josh McDowell. But the most telling testimony of all must be the lives of these early Christians. We must ask ourselves, what caused them to go everywhere telling the message of the risen Christ? Had there been any visible benefits accrued to them from, from their efforts, 
prestige, wealth, increased social status, or material benefits, we might logically attempt to account for their actions for their wholehearted and total allegiance to this risen Christ. As a reward for their efforts, however, these early Christians were beaten, they were stoned to death, thrown to the lions, tortured, and crucified. Every conceivable method was used to stop them from talking, yet they laid down their lives as the ultimate proof of their complete confidence in the truth of the message. Christ Jesus is risen from the dead. It's a historical event. To trust in Christ is no blind leap of faith. He has given us accurate and sufficient testimony of his resurrection in his holy word. So why doesn't everyone believe? If, if it's a historical event that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, why don't people believe? I like what Alistair Begg says. It's not that the evidence for the resurrection is insufficient. It is that it is unpalatable. The reality is men love darkness rather than light. The reality is the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Accepting the resurrection of Jesus Christ as truth means that men and women have a decision to make about Jesus Christ. It means that we have to come to terms with our own sinful depravity. It means we have to come to terms with our own mortality. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, the only proper response is repentance and faith. What is repentance? Repentance is acknowledging our simple estate before the Lord. It is acknowledging that we are who God says we are. And He is who He says He is. It's acknowledging that we do love darkness rather than light. Repentance is looking to Christ alone to save us from such a helpless estate. What is faith? Faith is trusting Christ's work alone. It's looking to Christ's perfect life, His sacrificial death, His resurrection, His ascension to rescue us from the wrath to come. To acknowledge the resurrection is true means we must flee to Christ for mercy. We must flee to God for mercy. Because that's the only place we'll find it, is in Christ. So Christianity without the resurrection is not false, but it is true. Before we move on, the question today is, what have you done with the risen Christ? What has your response been to the risen Christ? To ignore Him is to deny Him. Have you trusted Him? Have you looked to Him? Have you casted your case upon Him and His mercy? Are you still thinking you can somehow earn your salvation? Or you can somehow live up um, to His approval? Christianity teaches that there's mercy in Christ. I encourage you today to look to Him. And if you have questions about how to do that and what that looks like, grab an elder, grab someone and talk to him about it. We'd love to walk you through that. The Christianity, Christianity without the resurrection first is empty. Second, it's false. And last, it's powerless. Read verses 16 to 19 with me again. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be most pitied. Paul uses the word worthless in this text. It means devoid of force, fruitless, ineffectual, powerless. Christianity with no re resurrection has no lasting effect. It has no power in our lives. And there's three ways that Christianity in these verses is powerless if Christ is not raised. First, it's powerless to deliver us from sin. For if the dead are not raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. To still be in your sins 
means to be under the weight and condemnation of sin. To still be in your sins and our sins means that we're not forgiven. That we're under the guilt and power and shame of our sins. But the good news of Easter is that Christ has been risen from the dead, raised from the dead. So we are forgiven. Romans 4, 24. He was raised for our justification. Your greatest sin, um, we like to use the phrase, everyone has skeletons in their closet. The, the skeletons in your closet that you think no one else knows about, God knows. And the good news of Easter, the good news of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ is that those sins can be forgiven in Christ. Is that God loves sinners. That's what we all are. God loves sinners and provides free and total forgiveness in the cross. And because of the resurrection, you can be set free from the condemnation and guilt and shame of your sin. That's good news. We can flee. Often when we, we come to church and we hear someone preach and they start preaching about sins, we want to run from the church. We want to get away from the preaching of the word. But you need to run to the preaching of the word because it's in God's word. It's at the foot of Christ that we find mercy and forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness is found nowhere else other than at the feet of Jesus. So I encourage you today, look to Christ. Run to him. But not only are we forgiven of our sins, but we're also free from sin's ruling power in our lives because of the resurrection. We're not just set free from sin's penalty, but we've been set free from sin's power. We're no longer slaves to sin because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because Christ was raised from the dead. And John mentioned it earlier. He ascended to the Father. What happened when Christ ascended to the Father? Who came? The Holy Spirit came. And He came as our helper to empower us and indwell us and enable us to live the Christian life and enable us to live in a way that pleases God. We can't do that apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It gives us the power to live godly. Since Christ was raised from the dead, we are set free from sin's penalty and we are set free from sin's power. And I don't know what some of you think. And some of us have all felt this. You don't know how bad I am. Right? You don't know what I've done. He can't forgive me of, of my sin. You, don't, you really don't know me. And, and I would say, number one, you don't know all of us. You don't know what he's forgiven us of. And we don't know the Corinthians. I'm going to flip over to chapter 6 and, and give you a description of the believers that Paul is writing to who had been set free from sin. Listen to who Paul's writing to in this letter. And these people had experienced the free and full forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, those who violate God's command for sexual purity, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And I love verse 11. Such were some of you. But the good news of the gospel, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. The power of the resurrection, the power of the gospel, Christ sets people free from sin, from sin's penalty and sin's power. As we preach the gospel and talk about the love of God and what he's accomplished for sinners and that there's mercy and grace in Christ, 
it doesn't mean that we redefine sin as our culture does. Right? What do liberal theologians do? They say, well, the culture is going this way. Let's redefine sin to match the culture. No, the gospel says sin is still sin. God has not changed, but there is free forgiveness in Christ. And he gives sinners the power to repent through his spirit. Christianity without the resurrection is power to deliver, powerless to deliver us from sin. Next, if Christ were not raised, it is powerless to deliver us from death. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ was not raised, the sting of death would be permanent. Our believing loved ones would have truly died. Mom, uh, on the way to church this morning, my mom's here on the front row, we, we kept the family tradition. The family and I listened to new song, Arise My Love, like three times on the way to church. And if you've heard that song, you know I just dated myself, but we used to listen to it all the time growing up. And uh, we, we listen to it now as in the Montgomery home. But there's a phrase that I love in that song. Death, where is your sting? Right? Death has been defeated. The grave could not hold a king. The good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that death has been defeated. Our two great enemies, sin and death, were defeated at the cross, at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was able to defeat death. If there were no resurrection, we have no hope of eternal life. Why? Because Christ cannot deliver us from that which he did not overcome. If Christ couldn't conquer death, how could we trust Christ to deliver us to eternal life and to raise us up to eternal life? We couldn't. Our case would be hopeless. But Christ has conquered death. He has conquered the grave. Our greatest fear is death. And that fear is met with the resurrection of Christ. So today, as, as we come to a close, I encourage you to boast in the cross of Christ. Boast in the resurrection of Christ. As Christians, it, it's okay for us to boast if our boasting is in the Lord. We're actually called to boast in the Lord, not in ourselves, not in what we bring to the table, but in what Christ has accomplished for us. Christianity is not empty. It is not false. And it is not powerless because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I encourage you today as we close to believe the gospel. Look to Christ alone. You say how? Cry out to him for mercy. We don't have to make it complicated. Look to what he's accomplished. And if you're a believer in Christ, live as if the resurrection is true. I think many of us on paper would affirm the resurrection, but practically we're resurrection deniers because we still walk as if we're slaves to sin. Walk in the victory that has been accomplished for us in the cross of Christ. Join me in prayer, and then we'll have our benediction. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that Christ has risen. He has risen indeed, and that is our hope. We pray for the rest of the day that we'll honor and glorify you and worship you as you deserve. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.